We're going to go ahead and get started. Again, for those of you who jumped up at the end of the last session to get out of there, let me one, make one more reminder. You do need to sign in for each session if you want HR and CLE credit. So for those of you online, make sure you do that through the, the resources that we emailed out. And again, for those of you in the room, if you missed an earlier session, we do have those sheets out on the table. All right. Last session of the day, it is good to see the room still full. Thank you for sticking with us through to the end. Um, as I said earlier, I'm excited about this session. We're going to talk about workplace privacy, and we're dealing with things here that, as I said, aren't just new twists on old things, restrictive covenants, accommodations, and, and those sorts of things. It's important to stay on top of those and, and be aware of what's changed. But we generally know the, the landscape. We know the language. We know what the issues are. When it comes to workplace privacy, we are just entirely on new ground in many respects. And so I am personally looking forward to th this session and uh, I'll hand it over to the panel to take it away. I will be in the front row, so impress me. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, well, thank you all so much again for joining us. My name is Melanie Jordan. I'm an, a senior associate in the Labor and Employment Group at Dorsey Whitney. I come to you from Southern California. So contrary to Melissa's assessment earlier, the weather here is very different. Uh, <laughs> nonetheless, it is still enjoyable. And I have with me here, Kate, which I guess you can introduce yourself. Yep. Hello, I'm Kate Heaven Young. I'm a partner in the M&A group. And I am here today because I've been the general counsel of a few companies and also a privacy officer. So I am here to be your pragmatic, don't worry about it too much, we'll figure it out person. <laughs> And I'm Katie Irvin Carlson. I'm of counsel with uh, the firm in our Des Moines, Iowa office. Uh, and I'm going to uh, be talking about drug testing, which actually is an old thing with some new considerations. So I, I hope it's still exciting, Brian, even <laughs> though it's not a new thing that we know nothing about. So when we're talking about the term workplace privacy, this may come as a different or a, a, a new term to many of you, right? Some of you may hear privacy and think about, um, and think about, I guess, traditional privacy, right? In terms of, well, how much am I allowed to know about what my employees are doing when they're on the clock for me? Other of you, such as Kate and myself, when we hear the word privacy, we're thinking about your data, we're thinking about your social media, we're thinking about your devices and your employee devices, devices as well. And so what our panel today and Dorsey's larger uh, working group of workplace privacy is seeking to do is to speak to both sides of those issues of privacy. Workplace privacy is runs the gamut of issues. And unfortunately, we could take, you know, a week or fortunately, depending if you're fascinated or not, but um, we could take a week to discuss what workplace privacy issues arise, particularly as we're navigating um, what changes have arose in the workplace uh, within the last few years. The image on this slide actually is a pretty good depiction of what we're dealing with here as employers. You have a woman here who is um, who has a mask on. So she is in the throes of or having survived a recent pandemic. She's also working on a device. We're going to assume that it was company issued. It appears that she's working remotely as well. So she may have signed on to that company issue device by using her fingerprints and other biometrics, which we'll talk about today. So you see here in this image that there's a, a conglomeration of issues as well from a data perspective, but we also need to look at whether this worker was onboarded through um, a rigorous background check, um, which we'll talk about. Um, we don't know her conviction history. Uh, we'll also wonder if, if she was subjected to some kind of drug testing. If so, is she in sunny California where we've had some changes? Or is she in, um, well, sunny today, Minnesota, um, where we'll have some discussion of that as well. So when we're talking about workplace privacy, we want to encourage you all to take a broad view of what that term really means with respect to your employees so that you can stay on the right side of the federal guidance and state law that's coming down, which we'll talk about for sure. I think it's also important to note that this is important, important to your workplace culture as well. Um, employees are, at the end of the day, people and consumers. And we see that even us as consumers in our own right, we care about what companies are doing. We care about the products that they're using, how they're using it. And it's no different than your employees. They care about what you're doing with their data. They care about how much you know about them. 
they essentially wonder how much of you are in my business, essentially. And so we want to make sure that we're giving you some guidance today to think about as you navigate this um, pandemic, post-pandemic world and the convergence of technology in that way. So first we'll talk about background checks. Um, we have this handy dandy map here, which is showing up for both of you and I, red and green here. Um, I wanna talk to you about ban the box laws. Now you may have heard this term. It's also an, another way, cheeky way, if you will, to describe fair chance laws. Now fair chance acts have come down for a few decades now. I think Hawaii was one of the first states in 1998 to kind of initiate this fair chance act. And essentially they're designed to give a fair chance to those applicants who have a conviction history, such that you're not disqualifying them too early or considering a conviction that's not really related to the job position in which the, the person is in, inquiring about. And so um, you'll see here that these ban the box laws have now expanded greatly. And whereas they used to be primarily focused in the public sector, you're seeing here now that it's expanding quite a bit in the private sector as well. So statistics provided by the National Employment Law Project, um, they estimate that as much as 267 million people in the U.S. live in a jurisdiction in which a ban the box um, statute has been enacted. To put that in context, that means that's two thirds of the U.S. population is living in a jurisdiction with this law, which means everyone in this room should be aware of the fair chance or ban the box laws that are in place, not only from a state level, but also in some local cities, such as, for example, San Francisco, they have their own ban the box law as well, or ordinance. So again, by 2021, public sector, it's ramped up um, and been adopted by 37 states, including the District of Columbia as well, and approximately 150 cities and counties. And then we see by 2021 as well, private sector um, employers have, or private sector employers are also subject now to ban the box laws. And that's been adopted in 15 states and in 22 cities and counties, which would include San Francisco as well. So one law that I wanted to point out for you all, the flag um, that's upcoming is California's Fair Chance Act of um, 2023. And I say upcoming, meaning it's pending, likely that it may pass. And if it passes, it's going to expand the number of unlawful employment practices that are related to your assessment of an applicant's background. Um, it would impact nearly every employer. So everyone needs to really be keyed in to what this means for them at that um, recruiting stage. So for example, Section 2 seeks to amend California's version of the Fair Credit Reporting Act. We call that the Investigative Consumer Reporting Agencies Act. And job applicants are entitled to a disclosure at the outset that talks about the specific job duties of the position for which a conviction may have a direct and adverse um, impact or relationship to the job in which they're inquiring about or the notice should include all applicable laws and regulations that prohibit or restrict the hiring or employment on the basis of a conviction. So for example, if you're a bank or if you are an insurance company, there's laws that are also in place when you're dealing with these issues. The FCA um, of 2023 also has a ton of other prohibitions such as can't have a job posting that states any limitation regarding conviction history. You can't have a job application that, um, with questions that seek disclosure of conviction history, which to many of you, you're like, okay, that's old news. Thank you so much. But California makes that eminently clear. You also can't have an application that requires the applicant to share their personal social media accounts with you as well. And you can't take adverse action on the basis of an applicant's delay or even failure to um, provide specific conviction information to you. Now you can still conduct a conviction history background check um, when existing law obviously requires that, but you need to defer that inquiry or that consideration until after extending the conditional job offer. Um, this is important to note as well because California imposes civil penalties um, for violations by employers, which California, we love penalties. So <laughs> I just want to, flag this for you in case this law does end up getting passed. Now, some practical suggestions here. We would suggest that you ban the box across the board 
just leave conviction history inquiries off the job application. And to the extent that you're in an industry that's regulated by other laws requiring that, that, that dialogue, of course, abide by those laws. But at the outset, there's no need for them to disclose that on the application itself at the time. However, when you are dealing with someone's conviction history, you need to consider the time of that conviction and its relevance to the position. Is that correct? Oh, absolutely. I just want to rip off of this a little bit. I mean, mm -hmm. many of you are probably in industries where background checks are required for one reason or another. You know, you're working with children, you're in healthcare, you might be dealing with sensitive financial information or controlled substances. And in those instances, when you have to do these background checks, and you come up with a conviction that is potentially concerning, this is an opportunity when I've worked in the past to always um, work with someone else to sort of help in the analysis, whether it's another HR professional, whether it's your internal legal team, your outside legal team. We all come to these analyses and we all do our best, but sometimes we aren't fully aware and could have a latent bias that could impact our analysis. Also, you know, it's really important to take a look at factors and change circumstances. How long has it been since the conviction? Mm -hmm. You know, has the law changed Minnesota on convictions like cannabis, where maybe three months ago that was relevant, but in two months it might not be as relevant. Um, and also think about whether there's changed circumstances of the applicant. And I say that in a sensitive manner because it's possible that someone has had a conviction and then has seeked sobriety and become sober. You may end up getting personal information in connection with reviewing background checks. And so my last and final pragmatic mm -hmm. is anything that you learn should remain sensitive and confidential. Absolutely. And next, we want to talk to you about drug testing. Yeah, so this feels like a little bit of a detour, I think, on the privacy um, topic, sort of like Jack saying, why are we talking about the NLRB with non-competes? You may be thinking, this is an AI, this isn't biometrics, um, but we really are talking about, um, you know, people's bodily fluids or parts of their body being tested um, for employment purposes, and it doesn't get much more private than that. So that's kind of how we fit this all in here. <clears throat> Excuse me. I love talking about drug testing policies and uh, laws with our clients, uh, particularly because I think it's sort of a sneaky way that people can find themselves in legal trouble. So I practice law. Um, I'm, I'm licensed in Iowa. Uh, for those of you who have familiarity with Iowa law, we are not known as a robust employment law state. You know, you're not going to see us having paid leave on the map. We're not, we don't ban non-competes. Um, you know, we're not banning the box. But Iowa for a really long time has had this very robust drug testing law. Um, it's really complicated and employers are expected even by our relatively conservative Supreme Court today to follow it to a T. And we've had some recent cases come down where it was kind of, we, the, the employer didn't follow the policy, no harm, no foul, but this Iowa Supreme Court said, doesn't matter, you didn't follow, you didn't follow the policy. Um, and then impose liability. So I think this is a way um, that that employers should be thinking about, you know, sort of those sneaky ways they can get, they can um, get themselves in trouble. This gets even more complicated as states start to legalize uh, not only medical marijuana but uh, recreational marijuana as well. Because as the states are doing that more more often than not, they're also amending their drug testing laws. And so you need to make sure that you're up to date with what those laws are so that you're not running afoul of them um, as your drug testing employees. Um, sort of as a final uh, introductory comment, I think no matter what the policy is, whether it's drug testing, whether it's complaint procedures, whether it's discipline, we're always telling our clients, if you have a policy, follow it. And if you're not going to follow the policy, then don't have it or amend it or, or make it look, you know, write it in a way that you're actually gonna follow it. And I think we're seeing a lot of that with drug testing right now, particularly with regard to marijuana. We're getting calls and having conversations with clients who are saying, what should we do? Our policy says we're gonna test for marijuana. We don't really care. We're not gonna take action. Is it okay to just leave it in the policy and we'll just not pay attention to it? In some states that may be okay, but for example, in a state like Iowa, where uh, employers are explicitly required to say what they are testing for, if you're not testing for marijuana, but you say you are, that's a technical violation. And who knows what the Iowa Supreme Court would do um, with something like that. So 
I think these are all good considerations sort of as we're moving to the next phase of, of drug testing in the workplace. Um, just a little bit of history. When I was preparing for this, I found out that employer drug testing dates back to the Vietnam War. It was uh, essentially implemented by President Nixon um, and has obviously had prominence since then. Uh, with regard to marijuana specifically, which is what I'm really going to focus um, my section of this presentation on, this is just uh, some um, uh, statistics from uh, the Quest Diagnostics Drug Testing Index that just shows what positive marijuana testing rates are really going up in the workplace as marijuana becomes legal in more states. Um, that doesn't mean, and we'll, I'll, I'll talk about this more in detail in a minute, but testing positive for marijuana doesn't mean that 4.3% of workers were high on the job. Um, what and, and that's the difference between uh, the presence of THC and the presence of non-psychoactive cannabis metabolite, which I'm going to say NCM because that's a mouthful. <laughs> um, so the growing trend, we, we've seen this in California. Uh, it's, it's on the horizon in California. It's also uh, coming up in Oregon is these laws that say you can no longer test for the presence of THC in employees. You can only test for the presence of NC, or I'm sorry, you cannot do NCM um, testing. You can only test for, for the presence of THC. The issue is uh, someone ingests THC, whether it's an edible or they smoke it or however it gets in their body. And then after their body metabolizes it, uh, this non-psychoactive cannabis metabolite stays in their system for a period of time. Traditional drug tests would, uh, would, would find that as a positive test. So someone who's not actively impaired, someone who may have ingested marijuana weeks ago is still testing positive at work. So those kinds of tests do not test for an active uh, impairment or whether someone's under the influence. And the trend, it's its a slow growing trend. I don't expect this to be, you know, the law in Iowa next year by any means, but the growing trend is you can't test for the, um, you can't test for NCM anymore because it's not showing um, an active impairment in someone. So that's kind of the cutting edge part of, of the drug testing um, topic. And then I've got some just, uh, you know, notable employers that have just abandoned testing for marijuana altogether, sort of based on the idea that it's difficult to test for active impairment. So Colorado and Washington were the first to legalize uh, recreational marijuana in 2012. It's now uh, legal in many states. Usually it's for people who are 21 or over. In all of these states where recreational marijuana is legal, employers are not required to allow people to smoke pot at work, to deal drugs at work, to grow pot, you know, in the basement of work, whatever it is. Um, so there are some limitations despite it being legal. And of course, it still remains illegal at the federal level. So I'm not going to go through all of these. I just wanted you to have them in the materials. And now I'm sort of feeling regretful that I didn't make a map because I love the maps and everybody else had cool maps and I didn't make one. So maybe I'll make one and then do a blog post or something. But I've kind of tried to categorize, here's the states um, where uh, marijuana is legal, but there aren't they don't have a lot else to say in terms of workplace uh, testing, all the way up to uh, the states that are really specific about what employers can and can't do. So this is sort of the less strict uh, requirements for employers um, that yes, uh, marijuana is recreational legal, um, but there's no specific laws related to drug testing or employers can sort of still conduct themselves uh, business as usual, even though it's legal. The next uh, category is sort of stricter. So that's these um, four states here. Um, where they have not only legalized rec recreational marijuana, but they've also amended their drug testing laws to, in some cases, give protections, almost treating recreational marijuana use as a protected status and essentially saying you cannot discriminate against someone because of recreational marijuana use, um, limiting when a person can be tested. So yes, you can test for reasonable suspicion, 
Yes, you can test um, if there you know, has been an accident or something like that. Yes, you can conduct random tests, but you can't condition an offer of employment on the testing. So that's sort of the middle of the road states. Um, and then there's additional states here, Nevada, New Jersey, New York, and Virginia. And then we get to the states that have gotten very specific about uh, what kind of testing can be done, what kind of testing cannot be done. I don't know that Minnesota is necessarily um, unique or that I'd put it in the strictest category, uh, but it did, you know, they did add a lot of detail when they legalized recreational marijuana this year. And all of you um, in the room, I presume, are, are uh, working in Minnesota. And so I wanted to spend a little bit of extra time on Minnesota. So last year, if you'll all recall, the state legislature literally accidentally <laughs> uh, legalized marijuana in uh, an edible form. So gummies, foods that you could buy. Um, I think there were some seltzers and things like that. Um, and there were, there were comments from some legislators on the floor where they actually said, wait, did we just legalize pot? <laughs> And their colleagues were like, yeah, we totally did. Um, so because of that quote unquote accidental change, there was no change to the drug testing statute. And so that left a lot of employers thinking sort of, what are we supposed to do with this now that pot's sort of legal, but the drug testing statute hasn't been changed. So they fixed all of that. And uh, you know, I, I don't live here, I don't follow Minnesota politics, but seems as though this was much more intentional this year than uh, it was last year, not only legalizing uh, recreational marijuana, but also changing the drug and alcohol testing in the workplace in the Consumable Products, uh, Consumable Products Act together. So there are some exceptions. Again, you can read those, uh, but generally employers in Minnesota can no longer screen applicants uh, for marijuana use as a condition of employment. Again, unless it's required by federal or state law. So kind of those licensing um, things that Kate was talking about. Um, employers cannot discriminate against applicants based on positive tests. Uh, but like in some of these other middle of the road states, employers can still test for uh, reasonable suspicion or random drug testing. I would tell you on the random piece of it, if you, if you decide, you know, okay, Marijuana is legal in Minnesota, but we still want to, you know, we don't really want to employ people that that use the drug. We're going to do random drug testing. Make sure it's really random. Um, I worked on a case once before I joined Dorsey, actually on the plaintiff's side, the dark side um, <laughs> of employment law, and the employer used a third party vendor to select random people to be tested it devolved into this whole case about statistics and things that sort of made my head spin, but ultimately it wasn't a random test. And we ended up successfully um, settling that case and winning, uh, winning the case, uh, winning the case of trial and then settling afterwards because all because the test wasn't really random. Um, so that's just another example of where employers can just really get themselves into trouble. So be careful about uh, those kinds of things. Um, in addition, as with the other states, employers you know, don't have to let people um, grow pot in the break room, so you could still prohibit those kinds of things. And as I said, um, you, you are still allowed to test if there's reasonable suspicion. My, my caution on that is to make sure there actually is objectively reasonable suspicion. And Kate has this fun story about reasonable suspicion. <laughs> Oh, now, now, <laughs> now. <laughs> yeah, I was going to, I don't know that there's ever been a good day when you inform someone that they're going to be tested for, for drug use. Right. And so when I was talking about reasonable suspicion, I was sharing that the way that you conduct yourself in the day-to-day -day is actually critically important. If you routinely do not, um, you you don't show concern that someone may seem affected right? They may seem like they're not doing their job well. They may seem like they're on a substance. If you do not routinely uh, follow up on that, when it comes time to do a test, the fact that you haven't routinely enforced that in the past means that you can't because you sort of set the bar that you're used to people not really seeming like they're with it. So the fact that this person isn't with it isn't sufficient to do a test. How's that? That's the go. No, that's good. Yeah.
In other words, if they always act like they're high, how are you ever going to have reasonable suspicion that they are high? That's, That's right. That. <laughs> and that may or may not be a real life example. We will not. Likely so not. <laughs> um, so the last kind of thing I want to touch on uh, is, is very specific to California. For those of you who have employees in California, uh, I will send you to all of our lovely colleagues there to sort of help with those nuanced laws. But I just find in you know my sort of nerdy sense of, of geeking out over drug testing laws, I find the new uh, testing law in, in California to be really interesting. And I think this is going to be the new trend, again, not in the next year or two, but in the years ahead. I think this is sort of the next frontier of drug testing. So essentially in California, um, effective in January, employers will not be permitted to test uh, for the non-psychoactive cannabis metabolite. So you can only utilize testing that checks for current impairment. The reason why this was passed in September of 22 and doesn't take effect until January is because that type of testing that tests for current impairment of marijuana is not uh, there's not a lot of it out there and it's pretty expensive. So it exists, you can do it, but it's just not as economically uh, friendly as the other testing. And so the idea was, uh, I, I think in theory, to sort of give the market a little bit of time uh, to start developing these tests and mass producing them and making them more uh, affordable and accessible to employers. I think obvious, I mean, the obvious other impact of that is that employers will decide it's not worth, we're not going to pay for those tests. So we're just not going to test altogether. I have to believe that was probably part of um, the thought process and the calculation uh, in passing that law as well. But that again, seems to me to sort of be the new frontier is I, I, I would, I'm willing to, to bet that that's, these are the laws we're going to start seeing as recreational marijuana just becomes uh, legal in more and more states. Again, there are uh, exceptions to the California law. Um, the state of Washington is going to do the same thing effective in January. They gave employers less of a runway, so that was passed in May of this year. Um, but um, you will no longer in the state of Washington be able to, to test for that non of non-psychoactive cannabis metabolite uh, for employees, again, with exceptions for certain industries. So practical considerations. Obviously, uh, last year when I was here at the symposium, I got to speak with a couple of our benefit colleagues about remote workers. We're all still talking about remote workers, what the state's policy, uh, what the state's law is on not only the legalization of marijuana, but also what the, the state law says on drug testing is important. So beware, where are your workers and what are the drug testing and drug laws in those states? Um, what will you do? Again, if you have a policy that says we will do X if a person tests positive, then you need to do X. And if you're not going to do that, mm -hmm. revise your policies to be a little bit more um, updated, modern, however you want to say that. Um, Figure out if you are required to test because of a federal contract or because you have some sort of licensing requirements where even though the state says you're not supposed to test that you fall into one of those exceptions or one of the industry uh, exceptions. The other really interesting thing that I is sort of the other hot button topic on this one is I have I've been talking to a lot of clients who are essentially saying we can in our state test for the presence of marijuana. If we did that and made employment decisions based on that, we wouldn't have any employees because everybody's mm -hmm. doing it. Um, so that's another thing to think about. I mean, even if it's not legal in your state, if you feel like that would have an adverse impact on your ability to hire employees and you don't see it as, a, you know, it's not um, sort of presenting itself as a safety issue, then maybe just um, as sort of a modernization uh, effort you want to drop testing of marijuana. Do you have other practical I was just going to rip off of that, yeah. right? We're at work to work. And so long as we're working well, yeah. we're working well. Uh, I 
find drug, I personally find drug testing invasive unless it's necessary. And so really focusing on other metrics about timeliness and making sure that you're meeting your performance goal and encouraging managers to come to you proactively when they start to see a concern with an employee is going to be an effective way for you to manage using your existing policies that you have in your manual rather than having to rely on testing when you have an intervening event. Great, so let's talk about biometrics now. Um, when you're hearing that term, you are probably wondering, what is it? And different state statutes define it differently, but essentially it can be boiled down to um, unique physical characteristics used for automated recognition. And that would also include the data that is derived from those automatic measurements of those characteristics. So sometimes you may see a state statute that refers to it as a biometric identifier, and sometimes you may see a state statute that refers to it as biometric information as well. Sometimes they may use it interchangeably, but nonetheless, they're talking about that broad category of biometrics. Biometrics includes, from a practical standpoint, your fingerprints, um, a voice print, your hand scans, um, face geometry, um, a palm print as well, and your retina or iris scans. Um, we've seen employers use this in a variety of different ways. Um, you can use it through timekeeping measurements. So for example, you may have um, a workforce that can um, clock in using their fingerprint. I've seen that a bit. Um, you can use it to track productivity. So you can have a workforce wearing wristbands um, or other wearable devices that would track the employees on the job and provide haptic feedback um, while that's occurring. You also use biometrics for you know, safety and security reasons, inventory management, loss prevention and quality control. Um, so for example, authentication purposes. Going back to that image that we saw earlier of the young woman with the mask on, biometrics would be implicated there if there was some kind of fingerprint scanning going on or iris scanning such that she would access her employer's workplace or even the device at hand as well. I know, for example, at one of my previous workplaces, we actually did um, scan our thumb to enter into the building as opposed to having a badge um, for those employees whose um, thumbprints were you know, compromised for, in one way or another. They also had a badge, but generally everyone used their thumbprint. So that's an example of going in and out and um, accessing physical facilities. And also, again, I mentioned access to company owned devices. So why would employers use this in the first place? Many of you may be wondering that, right? Some of you, this may sound very Orwellian, very, very spooky. Um, a lot of it relates to just cutting down on paperwork. Um, a lot of it just reduces, um, I guess, human error as well. And as, especially as it relates to timekeeping, this allows employers to detect wage theft issues as well. So it's actually very helpful for rebuttable evidence um, to show that, hey, you said you clocked in at this time. Well, actually, your fingerprint, There's, it's very clear. It's no one else but you who clocked in at this time instead. So it's very helpful in that way. However, when employers aren't um, as careful about the use of biometric information, it can land them in trouble. So for example, in 2015, a court awarded a Pittsburgh-based employee $586,000, so almost $600,000 in damages for being illegally fired after he refused to um, use his employer's biometric hand scanner for clocking in and out. So the court there um, really looked at the, the employee's actual biometric use there. It wasn't like this, you know, amorphous concept. It actually was tied to the fact that he had to use his hand scanner as opposed to another method. So um, that is something that we all need to keep in mind. Now, here's some considerations when we're talking about biometrics. If you want to move your workforce into using this to cut down on paper, cut down on human error, cut down on just other issues, be aware that federal laws may be implicated here for your workforce. So for example, HIPAA, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, it addresses the requirements for protecting the employee's individually identifiable health information and their protected health information. So obviously, if you're using in, um, their iris scans, um, information about their palm prints or hand prints, that could implicate HIPAA in certain circumstances. GINA, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, this prohibits employers from requesting, requiring, or buying an employee's genetic information or that of their employee's family member as well. Title VII, 
that could be implicated as well. Someone may have a religious objection to the collection of their biometric data. The ADA, American with Disabilities Act, um, this prohibits employers from discriminating, obviously, on the basis of your disability or of a disability. So if an employee is unable to provide a finger, um, hand, eye, or, or face scan due to a disability, the employer should reasonably accommodate that employee. So that's something you should be thinking about. And then, of course, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, FICRA. This imposes certain requirements and restrictions on employers conducting background checks, which could come into play when employers are running the background checks on fingerprints, for instance. Other consideration for those employers who are multinational um, employers, those who have operations in other um, countries, particularly with those who have employees, customers, or business operations in the EU, you need to consider the GDPR. Um, GDPR has strict requirements when it comes to processing biometric data as well. So happy to help in that regard. We also have our lovely folks and our data practice as well, our cybersecurity and privacy team. We have uh, a breadth of experience in helping employers navigate those issues. So I wanna flag that for you as well. Um, you also need to think about your city and or state laws and ordinances. There's a plethora of them and they vary but generally they can be distilled down to these common themes. One, offer some form of notice to the employees that you are using biometric data in some way, shape, or form. Put them on notice, let them know. Um, also, a lot of these laws are asking that employers obtain clear consent, most often in writing. We would advise always in writing, please. Um, there's also restrictions from a lot of these laws on the sale or lease or other disclosure of biometric information as well. In the employment context, that would most often focus on disclosures as it relates to your vendors that you're using. So if you're using a, a timekeeping um, vendor and then you're tying that to someone who runs your pay, then that vendor as well needs to be on on, on guard and there needs to be restrictions in place for that vendor agreement. Um, a lot of these laws can also have the common theme of confidentiality, um, the retention of data, and then appropriate disposal standards for the data as well. So a couple of laws I wanted to flag for you, um, both at the city and state level, um, just so you're aware, is first would be the California Consumer Privacy Act or the CCPA. Sometimes you may hear the CPRA, um, California Privacy Rights Act, which just amends and in some circumstances supersedes the CCPA. The CCPA is going to be implicated. It applies to employers as of this year. So if you're not thinking about it, you should. This is, of course, assuming that the CCPA applies in general to your business overall. So for those employers who have had to deal with the CCPA in the consumer context, you're, you now need to be aware of that in the employee context. And as it relates to biometrics, the CCPA defines personal identifiable information to include biometrics. In fact, um, the CCPA also sections out sensitive personal information to include the biometrics. So if you are dealing with the CCPA, you need to make sure that you're providing a notice to your workforce, which would include your employees, independent contractors, those individuals, um, beneficiaries to the extent that you offer those benefits to them. And we can get more into that, but that's something I want to flag for you because a lot of um, employers will come to me and say, I want to comply with the CCPA because they read, you know, about it in some um, blog somewhere. And I'm thinking, well, what does that mean? Because it's very, very broad consideration. And as it relates to your use of biometrics, we really need to talk about that. Illinois, Many of you may have heard of BIPA, Biometric Information Privacy Act. Our firm has certainly dealt with litigation relating to that. Um, so you'll definitely need to be in tune with that and make sure you're staying on the right side of it. Of note here, this year in 2023, the Illinois Supreme Court held, um, well, had two important holdings that are applicable here. One, individuals have five years, not one, after an alleged BIPA violation to bring claims under the statute's pri private right of action. So now the statute of limitations reaches back, in my opinion, eons. And so, you know, be aware of that. Um, two, another holding from this year said that um, a separate claim accrues under BIPA each time a private entity scans or transmits an individual's biometric information. So in other words, when we're thinking about this in the employment context, 
if you're using fingerprinting to for your timekeeping purposes, each time that person clocks in and out, that would be an accrual under BIPA based on this ruling. And then you can imagine if you have an employee who's clocking in for the day, clocking out to take their meal, clocking back in to from their meal, and then clocking out for the day, that's four punches in one day. And then you multiply that. You can see that this is getting to be a bit much. Hopefully, subsequent Subsequent laws will tailor that and whittle it down, but as of now, employers need to be keeping this in mind to the extent you use biometrics in Illinois. I also wanted to flag Maryland. They prohibit the use of facial recognition technology during job interview process, absence consent, of course. Baltimore, in particular, bans the use of facial recognition technology both in the private and public sector, although it does exclude biometric um, security systems designed to prohibit unauthorized access. Um, New York State prohibits employers from fingerprinting applicants as a condition of employment or continued employment. Um, NYC, certain commercial establishments cannot sell your biometric information of employees, contractors, and et cetera. And then Portland, Oregon, also just completely outlaws the use of facial recognition technology, both by government agencies and private businesses as well. So those are just a couple of states that I wanted to highlight in cities. So as it relates to biometric information, there's some practical suggestions. You're going to need to data map. Data map just means figuring out where this your employee's information is kept. Where is it housed? This is going to involve a concerted effort with your IT team, which um, for those of you in the HR context, you're like, oh my gosh, like I do not want to wander across the aisle and talk to our IT team. And our, the IT team is thinking, I really just want to be left alone um, and deal with my awesome, cool, you know, technology. Well, you guys are going to have to get to know each other. And best quite friends. A, yes. Your best friends. Absolutely. <laughs> the best of friends. Um, in this regard, you're also going to need to evaluate your third party or vendor agreement. So that goes back to a comment I mentioned earlier, which is look at the vendor agreements that you have with your, your uh like your payroll processing vendor. Look at that agreement, see if you need to amend it in any way. Talk to us, we're help, happy to help you in that way. You're going to, going to need to provide notice and obtain consent to the extent that you want to use your biometrics. Obviously, this all means that you're drafting a written biometric data policy. Plug it into your handbook, as my colleague Heather mentioned earlier, and be sure that you're fleshing out accommodations that you'll make as well. Um, this will go into multiple sections of your handbook. So it's very clear that you are staying on the right side of the law here. This goes without saying, but you're going to need to safeguard the data as well, just like you safeguard any other information you're getting from employees with their you know, social security number, everything else, lump that right in there. You need to keep it safe. Properly dispose of this. This goes back to um, personnel file, record keeping. You know, you can't keep that stuff into per in perpetuity. You need to have certain limitations on it. And we're happy to talk to you about how long you need to keep it, depending on what jurisdiction that you're in. And then, of course, you need to train your employees who are dealing with this information in the first place. You can't think that just because this is so new, it's so amorphous, I can treat this haphazardly. No way. Because as we're seeing, especially in states like Illinois, we're accruing our causes of action here. You have some practical just, Yeah, just a couple of jump ins. I yeah. mean, part of the reason that IT is your best friend, and I'm going to say best friend one more time as it relates to this, is because they've probably already done some or most of this work for you. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to be, if you want cybersecurity insurance, you've done some data mapping. If you are PCI compliant, if you take credit cards, if you're trying to be SOC 2, you've done some data mapping already. So the work has started. I've also never had an experience where it's completely done. And, and so you do have to ask around to say, does anybody have anything weird in their desk? You know, you probably do it in a more formal way, but there almost always seems to be a little bit of stuff left somewhere. So it's always good to be comprehensive when you're asking questions. And then as with all of these written notices, they're only as good as how they are received. And I have been fortunate to receive feedback from folks on the floor from my HR teams, like, this is great legalese, Kate, but I'd like some English, please. Mm -hmm. So before you launch anything, have a few people read it to make sure that it makes sense to everyone, not just to your legal team. Absolutely. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Mm -hmm. So the last topic that we want to discuss is AI. And I just find this very, very fascinating. Mm -hmm. So I will contain my excitement. Those of you who may not share that with me, but I just find it super fascinating as it relates to the workplace. Mm -hmm. So I think the next video clip that we're going to show, it illustrates um, 
how the gov this current government is paying attention to AI and its use by employers. Um, the current chair of the EEOC, Charlotte Burroughs, she's spoken a number of times um, about the EEOC's prioritization of how employers are using a the a um, using AI. This also this prioritization is not unique to the EEOC. It's also something that's been echoed across the board by other federal agencies, which we'll talk about. And it's also been echoed, of course, by the White House. Um, we are, we're seeing it trickling down to state legislation, which we'll discuss as well. And then we'll talk about more practically, what does this look like for those of you who want to incorporate or who already are incorporating AI when managing your workforce? So let's hear a little bit from Ms. Burroughs. Other than predictive AI, generative AI, I think is not, um, I'm sorry, generative AI, I think is not really being deployed yet in the employment context yet. Um, but by some estimates, as many as 83% of employers and up to 99% of what's called the Fortune 500, so our largest companies, are using some form of automated tools to screen or rank candidates for hire. Employees are making their employers are making employment decisions also on the basis of, you know, so besides recruitment and hiring, once you get in the door, there are surveillance, there are um, a surveillance and monitoring is going on. You see decisions about assignments, decisions about promotions, decisions about mm -hmm. even who to fire or lay off being in some ways influenced by automated technologies. So she kind of lays out, this is the EEOC's and the overall government's understanding of how AI is being used. And she then goes on to discuss how they're honing in and pulling that in um, to their analysis when it comes to claims under Title VII and other laws that we'll talk about shortly. But I think it's important to note that like Chair Burroughs said that generative AI is I, I would disagree with her. She says it's not yet. I would say that it's not typically used in the employment context because I've seen discussions where employers are contemplating using it for um, generating uh, performance evaluations, for example. Um, so kind of sliding it off and, and, and delegating it to, to generative AI in that way. I think it's also important to step back and make the distinction between generative AI and then traditional AI as well. Um, and I want to emphasize that our discussion today focuses more so on traditional AI, because again, as Chair Burroughs said, um, and what I'm adding to that is generative AI in the employment context, we're still waiting to see how exactly employers want to incorporate it when it comes to managing their workforce. That's an important distinction as opposed to the employee's use of generative AI in performing their tasks, which this um, presentation does not address more so because that deserves an entire other <laughs> half day CLE um, discussion as well. But today we wanna to speak to you about the use of traditional AI and how the employers are using it on their side when it comes to recruiting um, and onboarding and managing the workforce as well. So how are employers using AI? Well, employers have been using AI for quite some time, right? Um, many of you may be employing it for uh, the use of scanning your resumes. For example, so for those employees who um, upload information through, I don't know, LinkedIn or wherever, there may be an outside vendor that you're using who is scanning the resume for certain keywords. And you're scanning it because you want to speak to those employees who have certain words that are coming up on their resumes, or you're um, fleshing out those um, applicants who have certain terms that you don't want, which we'll talk about why that may be a little problematic in a little bit. But Aside from actual resume screening tools, a lot of employers are using it for personality and aptitude tests when administering it through the interview process. Um, we're all in a remote workforce. You've heard that term quite a bit today and for the last several years. And so a lot of the recruiting and onboarding has taken place remotely through video interviews and whatnot. And so there is software that allows employers to analyze um, an applicant or a candidate um, when they are interviewing via Zoom or Microsoft Teams or whatever. And some of the employers have taken to using AI um, to rely, have taken to using AI through the use of self-help chatbots. So to the extent that um, you have a prospective candidate 
who is interested in the position, sometimes they'll use the chat box function, which you've all pretty much seen on many, many websites. They'll use that in the employment context to just kind of answer one-off questions about the position or about the, the company in general. And then also when it comes to on onboarding, they're using AI to skill map. So figuring out what this person brings to the table and where they would fit in most appropriately. And once that person is hired, we're seeing AI being used by employers and managing the workforce. So obviously through safety and protection reasons, um, I've seen reports from certain hospital systems, for example, who are using certain badges that can tell you how, uh, for example, when nurses are walking around on the floor where they are at any given point within the hospital, that, is, that hospital cited reasons um, for using that to include um, guarding against um, I guess, like active shooting issues that they had dealt with in the past. So now they can tell where their workforce was at the moment that something like that arises. Also, you can use AI to track employees' um, productivity. So um, you all, maybe Amazon customers, shout out to one of my friends who's here from Amazon today, but she um, may know that on the line, Amazon can tell you, and we as consumers can often see, okay, your order has been filled and it's ready to go almost you know, immediately. Well, you can also um, see the process by which those, um, those materials are being moved through by the employees and how quickly they're going. Um, you can also, again, use it through skill mapping. You have performance management as well. And then you can also use AI to determine succession planning. You may have seen reports through newspapers where you're seeing, or other news articles if you don't read actual papers, but um, succession planning, succession planning in terms of, okay, is this person likely to stay here or likely to leave? There's been those discussions as well. So you now know how you can use it and you may know what, if you are using this, that is considered AI. So what are the legal risks that are involved with this? Well, you can implicate claims under the data privacy laws. I wanna highlight the CCPA because I'm from California and the CCPA talks about um, data privacy in general. So you want to be cognizant of the fact that this may fall under that. You may see the use um, of AI implicate wage and hour claims as well when it comes to verifying somebody's time records, but more importantly, or not more importantly, in addition to dealing with someone's meal and rest period claims as well. So for example, if someone feels that they're being monitored for like productivity in some kind of way, they may feel a pressure to um, avoid taking a, a rest period or a meal break, which can garner penalties in many states, including in California. There may be labor claims to the extent that there may be inadvertent chilling of protected activity as well under the NLRA. Shout out to Jack for his discussion earlier. Um, there could be obviously claims with as it results to bias from the American under the Americans with Disabilities Act as well. So to the extent that someone has say their video interview analysis, the, um, if the if the software is looking at the individual's facial expressions, right, or if they're looking away or not maintaining eye contact, there's a variety of reasons why someone's not maintaining eye contact. It could be to a disability. It could be cultural reasons. Um, I also want to put a plug in for Coded Bias. It's on Netflix. It discusses the work by Joy Buo Lamini. I don't want to, um, hurt, you know disrespect her name, but she's an MIT scientist and she developed the groundbreaking work that showed that some of the software was more easily able to analyze the face of lighter skinned men as compared to darker skinned women. Obviously this kind of bias would carry over into the employment context, which could again, bring up claims um, for Title VII issues, FIHA in California, you name it. So you really want to be aware of what your technology is doing. And of course, you have your traditional privacy claims, such as in California. So I'll quickly run through some state legislation that's pending and enacted. Those states that are in orange has pending legislation that deals directly with AI in the employment context. Enacted legislation is in blue that deals with AI in the employment context. Those states that are in red have enacted legislation, but it's unclear if it applies in the employment context. And then those states in green have, again, pending legislation. It's unclear if they have legislation or if that legislation applies in the employment context. Federal agencies, like I noted earlier, this is on their radar, should be on your radar too. OSHA, EEOC, the White House also issued a request for information from employers on this. 
This has been going on since early last year. So we expect to see more and more guidance come down. And so for practical considerations, if you want to use AI or you just found out today, hey, I think I'm actually using AI now that you've defined it that way. <laughs> Be aware that AI in the workplace, it's governed by several different kinds of state and federal laws. Be aware of privacy laws. Be aware of data security laws. Be aware of anti-discrimination laws that might be in play. Um, if you're using these tools, we encourage you to conduct a bias audit as well. I talked about the, the kinds of bias that might arise. The information that's input is the information that will come out with these tools. Those who are developing it have a bias and therefore the way that they're being used will may inadvertently or disparately impact some of individuals who are within the protected classes. So you need to examine the quantitative metrics that are associated with it. Provide notice that you are using this both at the recruiting, onboarding and management stage. And of course, draft a policy that addresses it um, in those processes as well. You have final thoughts? I think you said it all. Okay, well, thank you all so much. All right. Uh, I'll just echo that. Thank you all very much for, for coming. We appreciate uh, so many of you in the room sticking with us. You know, we're just grateful for the opportunity to have these conversations with you um, from front to back. We hope they continue. Feel free to reach out to us. Um, feel free to keep talking to each other. There's so many things here that are that are developing as we speak. I don't recall who's, who said it. I think it was Heather. You know, we're making this up as we go nationally and at and, and a state level. So, Keep talking to each other, figure out best practices, share them, share them with us. We don't know everything. We just appreciate hearing from you. Um, uh, I'm losing control here a little bit. So with that, again, thank you. And hopefully we'll see you again next year. Bye.